So I'm going to talk about my invoice generator app today. As you can see, I'm here in the terminal and I'm CD'd into my server directory. I'm going to run nodemon, which is going to fire up the app so that I can go to localhost 3000. And you can see here it is. So what this app is going to allow us to do is add customers. you can see there and we can click and select the different customers and then we can zoom this sidebar over and then here we're going to be able to add job types and give them an hourly rate and a tax rate and these are going to be formatted correctly down here as you can see uh, so that when we go to do the math later and you're able to edit these as well so I can change this to $25 an hour and confirm and we can add more job types and sort of keep track of them here and you're able to delete those as well and now if we go over to work entries this is where we can start to generate our invoice over here so if I go to payroll and I say that we put 30 minutes of time into it and it went well I can create that shows up over here. It's going to give us a subtotal for that job type, the tax according to that tax rate we put in, and a total. And then if I add more jobs, the grand total will also update. So if I put that we spent an hour on that one and it was really hard work, we can create that as well. And it's going to add it to our invoice over here. So down here is where we can actually edit the invoice type. So if I wanted to go here and I want to say, you know, we actually spent 45 minutes on this. If you look over to the right, when I confirm this, you're going to see our grand total updated and our subtotal on payroll with the tax and the total on that updated as well. So now if I want to save this invoice to Julia's customer profile, I can hit create. And now she has an order here that I can pull up and you know, add another job over here. Maybe, maybe we did taxes for it too on this invoice. And this is $40 an hour at, you know, 7% tax rate. Go back to work entry, uh, go to taxes. You know, maybe that only took 20 minutes and we're not even gonna give that one a summary. And you see it added it to the invoice. If I go back to our work history, go to view, it's all still there. Now, if I go back over here and I want to switch to Andrew, you're going to see that he does not have a work history. But if I go back to Julia and I go to her work history, you can see that all of the things we added to hers are still there. And I can edit things from here so I can say that, you know, this was really good. And I can add that. And now it's on her invoice. And maybe I want to create a new invoice for her, so I can go to new invoice here, and it's created a new one, and I can, you know, add things and uh, give those descriptions, and now we've got a new invoice, and I can create that invoice as well, and now Julia has two invoices, as you can see, just as we entered them. So maybe I go back to Andrew, and I want to give him also an invoice. I can create that and you can see everything on, that is on the current invoice pulled up here is going to come down in this little table here to allow us to edit it. And the other nice thing is too, is if you maybe change the rate for something within the job. So if the job is now a $20 hourly rate, my invoice is also going to update over here accordingly. And maybe I want to create that for Andrew now. So now Andrew also has a work history. And Julia still has her work history over here that you can pull up and view the different things. And that is basically this app. It was built with React and the Flux architecture on the front end. And the data is persisted to a server. I'm using Node uh, with the Express framework. And we've got Postgres hooked up to the Express framework. So if I go up here to the URL and I refresh, it completely keeps track of my app state. You can see that Julia is still our logged in user up here. I've got this invoice pulled up over to her work history. All of her work history is still there. 
Same with Andrew, if we go over to his work history, it's still there. And you can see all of our job types are still here. If I go over to you know the work history, it's all still here. And you know if I create a new invoice or something, you can see that that table goes away because there's nothing on our invoice. If I go back and pull this up, it comes back. So one of the cool things about this application is the fact that I'm only sending down about three files. Basically, we've got our index HTML, our build uh, JS file, and an app CSS file. So if I refresh, you can see we're only making seven requests, which is nice. You can see how quickly that happens. And we've got one build min file that we are sending down. And there it is. It's minified and uglified with gulp. So we can take kind of a look at what our app state looks like here too with the React Chrome Dev plugin. And you can see how I've got this all organized. You've got these different React components in here that are all doing different things. And in our app is where all the state exists. So you can see, you know, I've got two customers in an array and I've got three different job types and we've got three saved invoices that we can filter on. We know who our selected customer is with an ID and we know what the currently selected invoice is. And so what's cool is if I go to like, you know, a specific React component, I've got properties and I've got handlers. So with the work entries, I'm going to be able to add a work entry, delete a work entry, and edit one. Those are all functions that I pass from the parent component down to the work entries component. It's got job types, and I pass it selected customer and selected invoice, all as properties. And that's sort of how all of these are working is, you know, I pass what I need to the specific components. So we can actually take a look at the code a little bit. So this is my front end build. If we go into the source in JavaScript, I've got all my components right here. And if we go into SAS and my app, I basically have a corresponding SAS file for every component. So if we go into, for example, um, you know, our sidebar component here, I've got a toggle function and you know the add customer, and this is where we call those functions that we pass down from the state. And then I've got my JSX here. And I can go into you know the sidebar SAS file. And what's nice is sort of when you pull these two things up, you can go over here and just look right at this JSX and see what the class names are and very easily know that this is the file that's going to get it styled the way that we want it to. And when it comes to those styles, I have one main SAS file that imports all those specific SAS files and maybe applies certain styles to the overall application. You know, I pull in a nice Google font here. I pull in Bootstrap right here, which you can see I've got that ported, pulled it down from GitHub. Same thing with Font Awesome. I'm going to pull that in right here as well. So the front end is nicely organized in that way. And then you can see my JS file, I've also got Flux set up here. So, you know, I've got one store. So all of the app logic is going to be going on right here in this store. You know, I'm pulling in the dispatcher and a few different things up here, pulling in my server calls from my asset folder. That way, when I change, the application state that I will end up passing back to my parent component here and I've got my event emitter set up that way anytime it changes the last thing that happens is a callback function down here um, you know so if I add a job or anything like this basically the last thing that's going to get called from app JSX is going to be get the current state it's going to go up here and it's going to grab this object and, and sort of pass it down to properties then to all of my child components. And I've got different constructor functions here to deal with the different um, things I would be keeping track of in my app state. That way, you know, when I go to add a customer, I can create a new customer and I can push it into app state customers. And all of these sort of do very similar things, you know, add job is the same kind of thing. I'm going to use that constructor, instantiate it, and push it into app state jobs. I'm going to update the server here. And this is actually an interesting point. When, you know, you go to update your server, right now the way I'm doing this is I'm optimistically updating my local app state before I wait for a response from my server to make sure it was a successful um, persisted lead data. And, 
you know, maybe in production, what you would want to do is make that server call and then have a dot then on that server call and not update your local app state until you know that the data was persisted on the server. That's definitely something for production that you would want to consider and probably do. Um, and, you know, you can see I've got all these different functions here, edit job, delete job, add work entry, and you know, these different work entries ones are actually going to call my work entry calculations up here, which is what produces the totals, the tax, and the subtotal. And I'm pulling in a package called money math to make sure that uh, my values are correct because JavaScript does not handle floats very well. And this ensures that all the calculations are going to be done correctly. That's why I've got money multiply and money percent doing these things to make sure that the calculations are accurate. So basically all these different functions here, the way it's going to be set up is I've got an app dispatcher that I'm registering all of them with. And it's got a switch case that depending on what is associated with it in my constants, it'll call the appropriate function when it gets triggered from one of my components. And, you know, the dispatcher and the constants, this is all, you can see it truly is just sort of boilerplate. A lot of tutorials out there about sort of how to set that up. Um, and my action, same thing. These actions are just all those same functions from the store. It's just dealing with making sure it's funneling through correctly according to Flux. And uh, what I'm able to do then is I'm able to export my app actions so that if we go back to my parent component here, app.jsx, I can require those actions. And then I like to set it up like this where I've got my var app create a class and I've got different handlers. So I know my sidebar needs certain functions. I know my job handlers need certain functions. So for example, with the job handlers, you can see these are just all app actions that are being called, which funnels through that process I just showed you there. So then when it comes down here and I go to new job, I can just pass it a handlers property, this.jobhandlers, and it's all of those functions that were in my store that were registered with the app dispatcher and in my actions folder. And then if I go over here to new job, now when I want to add a job, you know, this is just JavaScript that I'm basically grabbing the input values when the user clicks on my submit button. But I call this props handlers at job, which is just one of those actions. And so that's kind of how this is all set up on the front end is, is with Flux and the React, and I've, I've got it nicely organized here. And um, one of the interesting parts that I showed you earlier about how I only make seven requests is possible because of this gulp file here. So what I can do with gulp is I can take all of those different JavaScript and SAS files, and that's kind of what's going on here is, you know, Currently, I'm using Browserfy to deal with the module exports and require, and um, I'm using JSX Transform, which has been deprecated, I believe. A lot of the companies have made a move to start using Webpack, which is something I'd like to get into. But nonetheless, I've also got SAS hooked up here, which is going to concatenate all of my different SAS files into an app SAS, and then you know we're just going to build these. And the way I've got this set up is that my destination build is going from, you know, the way I've got the file structure set up here to pipe all of these things into my server folders, my server public folders. So if I go over to my server build and I go into my public, when I run gulp in the terminal or I run gulp production, it's actually going to put them right here. It pipes them into these locations for me. So while I'm developing, you know, I would be using build.js because I have source mapping set up. So if I've got errors and things like this, I can know where those errors existed in the original file structures. But uh, for production, you know, I've got the build min here. And I also have um, in my views on my index HTML here, this is kind of a interesting thing to show is you can see on line 10 there, it says that it's a build min. But if I go back to my front end here and I run gulp, it's going to actually change line 10 for me to point in the direction of my source build, as you can see. But if I go back and I run gulp production because I'm done and I'm 
ready to push this up to a server, you can see line 10 change back to the build name. So Gulp allows a lot of really cool things like that. And you know, at the end of the day, it's just it's going to allow for really fast load times because you're not sending down 10 JavaScript files and three CSS files, but sort of one of each. And it allows that ability. Um, and that's pretty much my application. Um, if we go over and look at some of the technical requirements for it, you know, I've got the time entry crud. As you could see, I could edit and it updates the invoices and I've got the job crud. It, you can edit all those and it updates the invoices as well and it saves it and it persists it to a Postgres database. And we've got the dynamic creation of the invoice, as you could see as well. Now, and, you know, in regards to production, I already explained a few things like I'm doing the optimistic updating right now before I make sure that it's been persisted on my server. Probably wouldn't do that in production. Probably would send the server call, wait for the response, and then update the local app state on the client. Um, you know, security-wise, there's a number of things going on. So I've got validations going on on the front end with the with the data, but you would definitely want to include validations on your server as well. You don't want to persist anything to the database unless it's also been validated on the server. I believe I took care of currency well. Um, that's why I included the money math package to make sure that things were being added and calculated correctly. So that's my invoice generator app. Um, I also have it put up live on my uh, Nginx server here. And you can see how fast that just loaded. And this is actually live on the internet. Um, Invoice.jacobrenneman.com. The only thing I'm working on right now is I installed Postgres on my Nginx server yesterday and I'm still dealing with some of the permissions. So if I pull up my console here, you can see that uh, basically if I go to update something, the post is just kind of hanging um, because I don't have my connection to the Postgres database quite working yet. But I'm working on that, just dealing with security things. but. The front end is fully working here on the live application, um, just unlike this one on the local host where my data is persisted. If I refresh this, Jacob is, is now gone. But we're working locally, just working out a few bugs on the server side. And that's my application.